Section 7 is all about God listening? I think so. In January of this year, Pastor Rob asked me to get ready for Psalm, I think it was 116. Turned out Psalm 116 was about Hezekiah. And uh, it, the day came that I was supposed to teach it, and COVID also came about that time. So we moved that up, and I felt led to preach that as a sermon on first Sunday in June. Jay gave me a, a lesson assignment, God Listens, uh, Lesson 7, and I turned to it, and there's good old Hezekiah. I get to talk to him about him again, but the thought crossed my mind, why do they say so much about Hezekiah? Uh, it was in Kings, he's in Chronicles, uh, we believe that that psalm uh, was his words, his feelings after coming through a very dramatic time with the bully of the neighborhood, Assyria. And now we come to Isaiah, who's also touching on that. Uh, I'm not sure why. Uh, some eventful things happened. There are some things we can learn that different than we did back in June. And I think there's three things we can take to heart and maybe make some adjustment in our life. First of all, we're going to look at the first, uh, the first prayer that he prayed in our lesson. It, and then later, not just the product of his prayer, but the product of his pride. The first prayer saved the kingdom. The second prayer and something he forgot to do set it up for a conquest. So he was promised some extra life. He didn't handle it too well. And then the other bully moved in. Talking tonight also about our priorities in prayer. And then also a question. God listens, but do we? God listens, but do we? So why should we listen? Jesus quoted Isaiah when he said that it has been given to you to know. You are given ears to hear. Not everyone has the ear to hear the sense of understanding. It is a privilege to hear. It's an essential privilege to hear and to see and to use it. One of the songs we used to use as a benediction in the, my youth days, way back in junior high, I believe, was, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. Think about that. What do you spend your time thinking about? And how much time do you give to the spiritual versus the secular? Uh, in Hebrews, it tells us that God's word can help us discern even the thoughts and the intents of our hearts. If we'll think, if we'll listen, if we'll consider it. God listens, but do we? Most people sort of like to do things themselves, at least until they try them. We get a little bit past Proverbs 3 that says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding until you check with headquarters. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. You know, there's a lot of topics. There's a lot of issues. There's a lot of things coming through our lives. We cannot be experts at each other. We would do well to re remember that. One of the first and best things I learned about settling our estate after Mary's death was to get advice. Uh, material from the funeral home said, there are these lawyers in the area who will give a half hour of free consultation. I recognized the lawyer who did our, our will back in 2007, and we did the 
power of attorney and some of that stuff renewed this spring. So I called, imagining a lot of complications. Talking to the secretary, she said, the lawyer's going to be out for two weeks, but what do you got in mind? By the time I was done with her, I had three or four issues covered. Uh, I don't have to go through probate. They were joint ownership things with, which go to sole ownership, and uh, you go to the bank, you go to the, the broker, and you go to the DMV. The cost of all that, $17. And I had our Buick sold. Now we still are processing the house. The lawyer got back in town. Uh, we filled out an affidavit, came up and signed it, and it's processing its way through the courthouse. But soon we'll have all that cleared up because I knew this was a transition I was familiar, I was not familiar with. Now quarterly, my quarterly says, Chapters 36 through 9 describe a period of transition in which the Assyrian Empire would fall and the next great empire, Babylon, would rise to power. God knew this was coming. Did Hezekiah? I don't think so. Now, Hezekiah's rule began at the age of 25, and he ruled for 29 years. It said that he had four crises in his life. The first one was his choice when he was made king. Would he rule like his father did, very corrupt, very evil? No, he passed that test. He followed God. But then another test came. The bully of the neighborhood, Sennacherib, if I'm pronouncing it right or wrong, that's the name for the night, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, uh, was pushing his way around. He'd sort of taken care of Syria, Assyria taking care of Syria, and then the northern kingdom, Israel, and now he was closing in on Jerusalem. Also had been pretty tough on uh, Judah even. Uh, first of all, he had his field commander, a guy named Rabshakin, asked him, why do you think God will take care of you? What gives you hope since you're being handled around about and you're about all that's left? But then they got a little carried away. He took it too far. I guess it was psychological war on the city, but he was explaining how they dominated all the gods of all the other towns and cities and all that sort of thing. And he said, not that God was unhappy, but God was incapable of saving them. He basically guaranteed that Hezekiah's prayer would be answered because he was basically attacking the validity of God, the capability of God. And Hezekiah's response is in our lesson tonight. That's the context. Uh, visualize. Hezekiah getting a letter from the messenger going into his temple, his church, his place of worship, laying it down on the altar, kneeling himself, and then reading it to God. That's in our quarterly in verses 14 through 17. Hezekiah took the letter from the messenger's hands, read it, then went up to the Lord's temple and spread it out before the Lord. Then Hezekiah prayed to the Lord. Lord of armies, God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you are God. You alone of all the kingdoms of the earth. You made the heavens and the earth. Imagine this personal talk. Listen closely, Lord, and hear. Open your eyes and see. Hear all the words that Sennacherib has sent to mock the living God. He recognized the fact that there was a big old army out front. But he also recognized the fact that God was the Lord of the armies. Not only that, he was the God of Israel. That mighty army on Jerusalem's doorstep 
could not be stopped by Hezekiah or by his army, but there was a God who could. He said, this guy's pretty tough down here, but I can visualize you in the heavens between the cherubim, running the heavens, the earth, and listening, hearing, and dealing. So ask yourselves, do our prayers do that? Does God hear our prayers? Well, maybe it has something to do with the priority of our prayers. If you look down in verse 20, what was his concern? Now, Lord our God, save us from his power, so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, Lord our God, you alone. Does God's cause, God's reputation, God's cause and kingdom come first in your prayers? Or does yours? Do you, pr do you pray, O oh, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, give us this day our daily bread? We're to pray, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Then we might get on to the smaller stuff. We might get on to the secular, the things. So what do our prayers tell us about our priorities? You stop and think about how your own needs and desires fit with the life that is also placing a great value on our love for God. Is his cause first and foremost? There are plenty of things to occupy our time. People have talked about weapons of mass destruction. I've read about weapons of mass distraction. Things that get us off, off on a tangent, off in a different way. Sometimes it's other religions or other views of religions. Shortly after we did all the building of our first two units here, uh, we had a lot of volunteer work coming in here, and so we would go out and help build other churches or Sunday schools or something, or do humanitarian work. And one of the, an the calls we answered was a, a call to Shadyside. Shadyside, where there was a flash flood coming down the Ouija Creek, and we went up there to tuck insulation in houses and uh, re, re drywall and do things like that. We also talked to the pastor who told us that when the Ouija Creek flood came down, the word got out that there was one of the students at the school drowned. He went to school walking up the walkway to the school to comfort and, and help uh, some of the students that were in his chapel. He was confronted by one of the administrators to say, you can talk to the kids and comfort them, but uh, let's not be talking a whole lot about God because this is, it seems like humanism, which by the way, Humanist groups, I understand, uh, are tax deductible, becomes a almost a religion in itself. We have other spiritual concepts we bat around. Uh, and sometimes I think, why are we so intent on mentioning all of our heroes? Is it so we don't have to mention God as we go through what we're going through? I'm not sure. Got a book recently that talked about the cross in the shadow of the crescent. Talking about is Islam at war? It says an informed response to Islam's war with Christianity. One of the lessons tells us we cannot take the continued existence 
of the church for granted. He reads, I know your labor about, this is about the church in Ephesus, that's in Turkey. I know your labor, patience, correct theology, but I hold this against you. For you have fallen, repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not, I will come to you, remove your lampstand from its place. That's the case in Turkey in our lifetime. It's 99% Islam. It is the official language. That's it. No space for Christianity. Back when we were young, and I was making it to a lot of pastor conferences and things like that, and they were warning about, about certain things, they said it's not uncommon at all for a church to be very enthusiastic in their early days, like he says, do what you did in the first days. Because if you don't, I'll take the lampstand away. The church will go dry. He said a lot of churches have that freshness and enthusiasm, but after a while, once we get things in place, sometimes there's less inspiration. We're keeping the trains running on time. The budget's being met. The attendance ain't bad and that sort of thing. And things plateau. The first love, the freshness, somehow gets dwindled. Jesus said in the last days, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Indifference, opposition. Those are threats we have. So how about us? How about our nation? Are we growing or shrinking as a Christian nation? What about the, our Judeo-Christian heritage of right and wrong and as it's woven into our, our laws as it's part of our fabric? Our, how about our churches? cross and the shadow of the crescent tells of some of the things that are going on. It reminds us that the violence in the Mideast moved a lot of people north into Europe. It says the proliferation of mosques housed in former churches. Doesn't that sound good? It's the fastest growing religion in post-Christian Europe, especially in Germany. They closed, the Roman Catholic Church closed six churches lately. And the Muslims are clamoring to turn those churches into mosques. The Muslim population has jumped from around 50,000 to over 44 million. There are 1,700 official mosques in Britain, many converted from former churches. Indifference, opposition. There are legal and social restrictions sometimes prohibiting us from exercising our faith and growing continuously, and the battle is going to intensify. Talks about a couple organizations in our country who in court cases sometimes unite with American Civil Liberties Union and the United, United People for the Separation of Church and State in their attack against Christianity. Yesterday, yesterday night's news spoke about a situation in Paris where a teacher in a school foolishly drew a caricature of Mohammed. A posse was formed, the teacher was beheaded. How big was the posse? Well, 16 people were arrested and one was shot. So, we see the shadow. But there's also good news. If you look down to verse 31, 
It tells of a surviving remnant of the house of Judah, again taking root downward and bearing fruit upward. Well, the headlines say little about what's going on in the back roads and countries across the world. Work is going on. There's a trans world radio that, of course, can speak truth across a bamboo curtain or an iron curtain or any of those curtains and effectively reaching many people in the Mideast. They get con contacts, they get questions. For years I've been giving to a literature organization that distributes Christian literature in virtually all the countries in the world, including about 40 of them that are what they call creative access because you don't go out and openly do it. You work your way in and do certain things. Uh, I'd say 40 out of the countries in the world, one typical prayer request, please pray for a woman named Zero and her roommate, both intrigued by Jesus and the fact that he came into the world to die for them. The Every Home team is sending them a Bible. Another went over in Central Asia. The Every Home team in this nation is praising the Lord because new people are being saved and new Christ groups are being planted. Please pray for God to protect these new believers as they grow in their faith. So it's not all dark, but we want to understand what we may be dealing with. Probably in Europe, this generation, probably in our country, in the next generation. Verse 32 says, a remnant will go out from Jerusalem and survivors from Mount Zion. The zeal of who? The Lord of armies will accomplish this. So do you ever feel like as a nation we're brushing aside or even opposing Christianity in our official pronouncements? We talk about the freedom of worship, which sounds good, except it's basically saying keep it inside the church walls. And of course, we're not doing that. So it says in verse 35, as that bully was attracting their, that city, I will defend this city and rescue it for my sake and for the sake of my servant David. Enough is enough. We're fighting a virus that has taken out about 200,000 people I think, across our country in five or six months. There was a pestilence or a virus or something one night that took out 185,000 of Sinatra's soldiers. They woke in the morning. They looked around the camp. Just a few left. 185,000 dead. So Naturib and his few left, headed home, got back to Assyria, and ironically, he was killed by his two sons, and where was it? In the house of his God. God has his ways, very thorough ways of dealing justice at the right time. Sounds like the right way to me. The next crisis Hezekiah had, he was sick. I guess Isaiah was not the most subtle, not the most subtle of prophecies. He says, he comes in and says, the Lord has said, set your house in order for you shall die and not live. That's warm, isn't it? That's comforting, isn't it? That's what it says in the Bible. And it says, he got so shook up, he prayed, wept bitterly, and beat on the wall, even as Isaiah was leaving the place. And God stopped Isaiah and said, go back. I have heard him. I guess he said, I'll trust him to set in order his house, and I'll allow him 15 more years. 
But when you read chapter 39, it's not so good. Pride took over. I guess he'd forgot that the Lord said something about setting the house in order. He just knew he was heading for 15 more good years. And he was feeling pretty good about it. A future ruler came to visit. Brought him a present. Brave him. And praised him on his credible prayer life and victory over Sinatra. And pride took over. And he showed him all the wealth and all the bright spots in his culture, in his kingdom, in his house. Jesus says, you need to be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. He was not as wise as his serpents. God showed him his riches, or he showed the man his riches. And Isaiah was back. He said, what have they seen? He says, all. He says, all that is in your house will be carried away to Babylon. And had not God said, get your house in order? I mean, he was about 39 or 40 when he got that warning. He certainly wasn't just thinking about his estate. If he was, he could have done a better job on that than he did. He could have done something with his household. He had a son named Manasseh. Turned out to be a return to the wicked leadership that they'd been struggling with. Manasseh was bad news. He could have had a legacy. So how do you set your house in order? Is it just going to the courthouse? Or do you set your house in order in spiritual things? Is it just taking care of the bank account? Or is it giving spiritual leadership to the kids? What about the household? What about the leadership provided to future generations? Could he not have poured some of that energy, that free time, that extra time? He fell for flattery. Are you getting any flattery these days? I am. I get letters every day telling me how I'm important to one political cause. They want to get my views on things so they know what's going on in Little Hawking. And they spread it on pretty good. It might be a turn on to some, but it's a turn off to me. I give to a cause, not so they'll send me another questionnaire asking what I think on all these softball questions that you know what the answer is because they're, they're getting chummy and trying to prop, prop you up. Proverbs 2019 says, Meddle not with him that flatters with his lips. Another verse says, A man that flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. Isaiah said, it's all going to go. It's all going down to Babylon. Then he says, and some of your sons will be eunuchs in the house of the king of Babylon. And his reaction at least there will be peace and truth in my days. I hope he was just declaring, I'm going to make things right while I'm here. But I think he was saying, okay, as long as it don't happen on my shift, it's all right. It'll be okay. Can you imagine? I can imagine. I see a nation declining. Morally, I see a nation with 
unfunded obligation about that high financially. I see a nation making unwise alliances, being taken care of. A legacy, leadership, is finding out what's standing after you're gone. And are you working on it? So, is our priority as great to get our spiritual house in order? For our prayers shaped in that term, Are we having a hard time fresh? I like one of the Proverbs also says, commit your works to God and your thoughts will be established. Basically, I think he's saying, get involved and you'll have plenty to pray about. And it won't be all material. It'll be spiritual and it will be something you need to know. I have another question. When you have conversations with people, how do you feel if the other person does three-fourths of the talking, it's almost all about them and theirs? A little bit of hearing, at least, maybe listening, too. There is a difference of yours. What's your reaction? What do you think God's reaction is? And we sit down, read, punch out our few vet verses, formalize our requests. Got to be up and going. You think he's disappointed? Saddened? Hezekiah was a great guy. One fatal flaw, pride and not listening. We can be grateful that God does listen. We should be confident in that, and especially when we listen to him. Take that step we need to take. Ask for the advice we need to ask. Commit that energy and that freshness. You know, we're moving a lot of things around here right now. We had to stop almost everything. Now we're starting up this, and that, and the other. Made me think about some of Mary's kidney episodes. Kidneys weren't working, so they said, get off the medicine for about two days, hoping that when you restarted the medicine, it would be sort of a fresh experience and they would kick in, and it worked that way. We've been off some medicine here, and I pray that as we kick in on this activity and on that. As we enlist people and approach people to do the Lord's bidding, and that we will ha find that Ron's favorite word, many hands make light work. There's enough to, to do, enough people to do. And we attack things and even enlarge our vision a bit beyond what it was in the past. Even as we recover, we trust from these things that are going on. There's a chapter that I have not got to in the book yet, saying the church, the remnant, will come through. be interesting to see how it is. That his uh, 
effect of God. We call Satan the prince of the power of the air, the airwaves. We're doing pretty good with the airwaves too, aren't we? The people are looking in and hearing who maybe couldn't get out. The uh, COVID-19 keeping them in place. Perhaps listening to lessons they haven't heard before. Giving thought to the spiritual, not just the physical, which dominates a lot of our thinking. I guess God knew what he was doing when he was recording Hezekiah's happenings in Kings, Chronicles, Isaiah, and yes, we think in the Proverbs. Now next week, God renews. He provides strength for those who trust in him. It's Isaiah 40, 18 through 31. We can renew. God offers that, especially on the heels of what he was talking about in 36 through 39. The people needed a lift. They needed a boost. They needed to be looking forward, not just back, on the issues they had. So we'll be seeing you next Wednesday at 6.30. And if you need to go pick up someone from some of the activities, go slow. I didn't finish the whole 45 minutes. You can walk slow, but in four or five, they'll be looking for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. It does really show us the thoughts, the intents of our heart. Indeed, may the words of our mouth, but also the meditation, the thoughts of our hearts, be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. We're thankful that you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen.